Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. It's been a while since I've done this, but what I'd like to do today is answer lots of questions. A couple of decades ago, I was given this binder by the minister in the Worldwide Church of God and basically told that these were subjects that people could preach on. Now, this is when Worldwide Church of God was starting to have some changes, but most of what's in this particular binder were actually just questions and answers from people who wrote the old Worldwide Church of God about a variety of different subjects. And this is essentially the official answers. So I'm going to use those as basically my notes. I hope to cover a lot of subjects. What I've got in mind by looking through what we probably get through today is organ donations, chewing tobacco, Joseph Tkach, servile work, Sabbath intercourse, holy kiss, homeschooling, December 25th, the Bilderbergs, uh, maybe we'll get into legal rights, uh, prophecies of Daniel, uh, something about the tribes, and even maybe about uh, men wearing earrings. Uh, might get more than that or less, depends how much we end up covering. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this where I left off last time in this book. And if you, any of you have the old Worldwide Church of God uh, personal correspondence letters, this first one has to do with letter 165. So the question on the first one was, what about organ transplants? So let me read a, a paragraph or so of what the old Worldwide Church of God uh, taught about this, and then I'll add some other things to it. The Bible's not comment on medical procedures such as donating or receiving organs. The question of how to care for one's body is essentially a personal one and must be answered by the individual. We don't offer medical advice. For any need along the line, we recommend talking to who's the most qualified uh, healthcare practitioner you could afford, it says. We also recommend living by sound basic health practices such as eating a balanced diet, getting proper rest and exercise, maintaining a tranquil mind, and so forth. Anyway, it says uh, the Bible recommends that you pray about various things. So the question is, what about organ donations? Um, well, personally, I don't see a problem if someone were to donate a kidney to uh, a relative or somebody else. But what about leaving your body to science? They didn't cover that. When I first moved here decades ago, I, in California, you put a card on the back of your uh, driver's license that said you were willing to have that happen. Um, however, things have changed, so I don't have that anymore. And basically the reason I don't do that is that nowadays if you leave your body to science, uh, they do things that are not necessarily morally correct. Uh, they use tissues any way they want, and <clears throat> it's not always the way the donor intended. So the, the short answer to the question is, if you want to donate an organ, you can. If you want to donate your body, that's up to you. I have res reservations about that. Which also means, by the way, if you had a kidney problem, to use that as an example, and a relative offered to donate a kidney to you and you needed to get one, uh, we would not say that's improper to accept. Of course, God is our healer, and we hope that uh, <clears throat> you will not be in a situation where you need to do that. Now, related to health, the next one is, this is letter 166. Thank you for your question concerning the use of chewing tobacco or snuff. And it says, as you no doubt realize, tobacco contains certain poisonous substances. Uh, tobacco in any form, according to this I'm reading this letter here, does not reflect proper respect or, or care we should have for the human body. Then they cite 1 Corinthians uh, 3 verses 16 to 17, which I'll read in a second. <clears throat> I'm not sure why I've got a tickle in my throat. Anyway, this is from the old King James. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, he, him God shall destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And Christians should break free of... Uh, Bad habits, and they cite Romans uh, 6.16. It says, even though it may be difficult to overcome, it's nevertheless possible to do so. I went to the Center for Disease Control's website and wanted to 
go over a few things they have about uh, what they call smokeless tobacco. So that would include, uh, I guess, what's called snuff and chewing tobacco. Anyway, it says smoking, smokeless tobacco contains nicotine, which is highly addictive. Because young people who use smokeless tobacco can become addicted to nicotine, they're more likely to become cigarette smokers. Many smokeless tobacco products contain cancer-causing chemicals. The most harmful chemicals are tobacco-specific nitrosamines, which form during the growing, fer curing, ferment fermentation and aging of tobacco. And the, the amount varies. Uh, the higher there is, the usually greater risk for cancer. They can also have uh, some, something called a radioactive element called polonium-210, which is found in tobacco fertilizer, and some other things such as heavy metals like arsenic, beryllium, beryllium, sorry, finally, I should have known how to say that. I used to be able to say it. Cadmium, chromium, cobalt, uh, nickel, lead, and mercury. Uh, smokeless tobacco causes cancer of the mouth, esophagus, and pancreas. It can increase or cause uh, white or gray patches within the mouth. It can lead to cancer. It can cause uh, gum disease, tobacco, excuse me, tooth decay, and tooth loss. Uh, during pregnancy, if you use it then, it increases the risk for early delivery and stillbirth. And it also can affect uh, the brain of the newborn, presumably the baby's born. It also increases your risk of uh, heart disease and uh, stroke. Now, I grew up around people who smoked. Uh, it was clear to me that quitting smoking wasn't easy. I uh, really wasn't around anybody who chewed. Uh, I, I will admit once, at one time, somebody offered me some chewing tobacco when I was a young teenager, and I foolishly tried a little bit, and I spit it out within, I don't know, 20, 10, 20 seconds. So no, I shouldn't have done it, uh, but I did do it, and I'm glad I didn't stick with it. You know, as Christians, you can ask God for assistance in stopping smoking. I'm going over here because this is where I've got, I moved everything today in terms of what I want to put up. Uh, we've got a book, of course, called Prayer, What Does the Bible Teach? Uh, this booklet and any other one I might hold up is available at the ccog.org website. For example, the other one is about faith, faith for those God has called and chosen. And you can have faith that God will help you. But what if you make mistakes? What if you stumble? Let's go to Matthew 26, verse 31. Consider something that Jesus said to his disciples. This time I'll read from the New King James Version. All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Well, a dozen of the stumbling disciples ended up being the twelve apostles. Now, James wrote, I'm going to go to James 3, verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Yes, we all stumble. Now, you might be sitting here and thinking, well, I don't smoke, I don't chew, so therefore I'm not stumbling. Well, James warns here, if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. And the implication is no. and Because again, he says, we all stumble. And James was including himself in this. Now, if you stumble, what are you supposed to do? Well, get up. We need to endure. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, 11, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, if you're still in James, you can go to James 1, verse 12. James also wrote, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. But when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now I want to go to uh, Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 20. Read something that Jesus said. Matthew 13, starting verse 20. But he who received 
seed on stony places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has got no root in himself, but endures only for a while. When tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And so some stumble and then give up. But you're not supposed to, give, to do that. You're supposed to continue. Uh, going back to James, probably should have kept you in James. James 4 this time. Here's something that G James wrote. James 4, starting verse 2. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you don't have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your, pl own pl on your pleasures. Verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit which dwells in you and us yearns jealously? Be careful that you're not using tobacco to try to get along with the smoking crowd or the chewing crowd. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 33, you don't have to go there. We're, we're going to stay in James. The Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, 53. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. So one of the reasons I read this part in James about lusting is like, oh, you've got to be around friends who smoke and, or chew and if you want to fit in, if you want to do this. No, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. Now, if you're still in James, I'm going to continue uh, this time in verse 6. James 4, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. But sometimes it seems like you know you, you pray to get over something and you, you keep stumbling and you just got to keep going and giving up. Not giving up, by the way. Not give up. Got to keep going. Don't just say, "Well, I've tried that and I'm not going to do it anymore." No, you have to keep trying. Many of us face certain tests and trials. It seems like we're facing some version of it over and over and over and over again. Uh, it seems sometimes there is no way out, but. There are our ways out. It sometimes takes a lot longer than you think it would or should. I mentioned 1 Corinthians 10.13. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the entire verse this time. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. As other people chew or smoke or whatever... But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation make a way to escape that you'll be able to bear it. Physical ways to bear it would include changing what you're doing when you're tempted to smoke or to chew. Do something else. Don't hang around with people to do it. Go to another room. Start reading the Bible. Take a walk. Maybe exercise vigorously, etc. You know, consider the analogy about getting air out of a glass. Here's a glass that's got about a third air. How do you get the easiest way to get air out of the glass is to pour liquid into it. Of course, I just did the opposite here. On your own, without equipment, we can't make a vacuum. But we can change a glass by pouring water in and air leaves. So we're supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, push out the lust of the flesh. And I'll just read from Ephesians 5, verse 18. So do not be drunk with wine, which is, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now I'd like us all to go to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. Let's 
says, starting verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant, apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who obtain like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace, peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of the Lord and of Jesus our Lord, of knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which you've been given to a by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust but also for this very reason given all diligence so it means it's not always easy. You've got to be diligent. You've got to pay attention. Add your faith virtue to virtue knowledge to knowledge self-control. And I know self-control is difficult. Now, I don't have a problem with chewing tobacco, even though I succumbed to some peer pressure once. But we all have issues of self-control and other things we've got to work on. And it's, it's not easy. It's easier just to read it than to, to, to actually do it. Anyway, to self-control, perseverance. So you keep trying. Even if you stumble, you got to keep trying. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness. It's forgotten he was cleansed from his old sins. You say, but you're cleansed, but you're still doing some of these things. Well, you have to keep working on it. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. So don't say, okay, I've had this problem for a while. God's tolerated it. It's okay. No, it's not. You still have to be more diligent to, to, to work on this. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not easy. The Bible says if you endure, humble yourself, resist Satan, draw near to God, and get to the point where you will not stumble in your efforts to stop smoking or chewing tobacco. Now there are some physical things that also can be done. Um, I've noticed clinically that sometimes providing nutrition for the thyroid can be helpful. For some people, a small amount of sea vegetables like kelp can be helpful because it's got iodine, the thyroid needs iodine. Uh, the thyroid hormones are also made out of uh, something called tyrosine, which is an amino acid. Um, you can get this through uh, uh, soy, but I recommend non-GMO GMO soy, or something called the winged bean or princess pea. And sometimes uh, uh, through various uh, supplements or bovine thyroid or whatever. So there's some physical things you can also do. But one of the things you really need to do is decide that this is something you have to take steps on. And again, it may take a while. And you may stumble. If you stumble, get back up and keep going forward. Now this next one is letter number 168. Hey, somebody wrote about, asking about uh, Joseph Tkach, Joseph W. Tkach. Now, at the time, he was the pastor general of the old Worldwide Church of God being appointed by Herbert W. Armstrong. So here's a little bit about what the, the church said about him once he was in charge. Joseph, Tukat, J, Joseph W. Tukat, born 1926, is pastor general of the Worldwide Church of God. He's an experienced administrator, succeeded Herbert Armstrong, the late Herbert Armstrong in January of 1986, the leader of the church and its related organizations. He'd been a member of the Worldwide Church of God since 1957 and an ordained minister since 1963, he had various positions there. He's a native of Chicago. Uh, so that's some of what they said <clears throat> about him. Now, when he was appointed, I heard him say he couldn't fill Herbert W. Armstrong's shoes, but he would strive to walk in his footsteps. Interestingly, one of the things people don't realize is one of the first things he changed when he said he wasn't going to make changes was he, the World Watch Church got quit teaching church eras. You know, we talk about those all the time. Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. He quit teaching that, uh, which helped people become more Laodicean, if you will. We've tended to believe that the Laodicean era, if we could put a start date, would be the date uh, 
Joseph Tkach became pastor general of the old Worldwide Church of God. But he was more than just Laodicean. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Another thing he changed, by the way, was I think I think it was somewhere maybe around August of 1986, he published something about 18 truths Herbert Armstrong said he restored to the church, that God had him restored to the Philadelphia portion of the church that the Sardis era of the church did not have. Well, in addition to not going into the era part of it, the 18 truths were not Herbert W. Armstrong's list. There's a sermon online you can listen to where you, there actually is a list. Uh, a long time ago, my wife Joyce and I actually uh, read, wrote an article for a publication called The Journal, News of the Churches of God. And we went through, explained how when they came out with Herbert R. Armstrong's autobiography, they yanked out everything to do with church eras. A lot of people think that the hardcover version of the autobiography they were all sent was Herbert Armstrong's autobiography. No, it was an edited autobiography. The last published, printed, actual autobiography Herbert Armstrong from 1973, and that's one of the ones that I looked at, and it's very different on certain points. Anyway, when uh, Takach came up with his list of 18 truths, he once said he was going to stick with those, which he didn't. But secondly, it wasn't Herbert Armstrong's list. And I think part of the reason the list was watered down was to make change easier for them to happen. Now, when he became Pastor General, they talked. he wrote about the passing of the baton and talking about the mantle and that type of thing. And the question is, did Joseph Tkach ever have the true mantle of leadership? Now, some people will say, well, Herbert Armstrong appointed him, therefore he must have. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was discussing mantle-related issues with uh, Aaron Dean, who was the personal assistant of Herbert W. Armstrong. As a matter of fact, uh, Aaron was offered the position uh, to, to run the church, and he had turned it down. He didn't think it was appropriate. Now, Herbert Armstrong told Aaron that, okay, that's fine, but God's going to have you do something else later, and we'll see what happens with him and that. But I was discussing this with uh, uh, Aaron Dean, uh, and I said, do you think that perhaps Joe Tkach was a you know, true Christian believer, and then he just got misled later? Uh, so did he hold the mantle of leadership for any particular period of time? And Aaron Dean's opinion was, no. He said that he misled Herbert Armstrong. He led him to believe that he believed all what the old Worldwide Church of God taught, but he didn't actually believe it. And he told Herbert Armstrong he'd be faithful to doctrine, and then he was not. So in Aaron Dean's opinion, despite Herbert Armstrong passing uh, the pastor general title over to uh, Joe Tkach, Joseph Tkach Sr. never never held it. And the other thing that Aaron wanted to mention to me, and I don't think he, he I didn't tell him I was going to speak about this, but I will now, is that Herbert Armstrong told him not to pass on titles to him like apostle or that type of thing, those type of spiritual titles. And even though Joseph Tkach indicated he wanted such a title, uh, Aaron said he was told not to, to do that and he wouldn't shouldn't have such a title. And so that basically was his view on there. One of the reasons this is somewhat relevant to us in the Continuing Church of God is, you know, we've got a booklet on the continuing history of the Church of God. And I'm planning on updating this particular book a little bit because I'm considering putting in more of a succession list uh, from uh, the Apostles uh, to, to present. And one of the reasons I'm looking at doing this is because we've been challenged uh, we had somebody uh, in Australia who was basically said, look, told by somebody who was Roman Catholic, look, the continuing church God just started in the 21st century. It's just another Protestant sect. It doesn't have continuity and blah, 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 blah. So because of those type of issues, I've decided it would be helpful to come up with a, a list. And we can't list everybody because there's big gaps uh, that we just don't know. Part of the gaps were because of records that were intentionally destroyed by uh, Greco-Roman authorities. Uh, some of a church historian by the name of Eusebius intentionally didn't uh, report, didn't identify, didn't want people to know. And then we have the 1260 years in the wilderness. But 
from the early 1600s to present, uh, we've, I've been working on putting together a list. At some point in time, I'll go over that. And that's one of the reasons I called Aaron Dean was, should Joseph Tkach actually been in the list? And he doesn't think so. And uh, after talking to him, I concur, by the way. So if I do put a list in, another version of, version of this, uh, I don't intend to have him as a successor, although he is also mentioned in here as somebody involved in the whole process, because he certainly was involved. But anyway, it just turns out that because I was going to do these questions and answers, one on Joseph Koch came up, so I thought I would go into that and share some of what I've been working on uh, regarding to uh, church history and those kind of matters, and our continuity. All right, the next letter has to do with a word that's not really used such anymore. It says, thank you for your question concerning servile work on the Sabbath. The word servile specifically mentioned in connection with the annual holy days. And that was a term that was used in the old King James Version of the Bible. But, if, for example, the new King James Version, under Leviticus 23:25, the term is customary work as opposed to servile work. And basically it means you're not supposed to be doing the type of work that you're going out and getting paid to do. Also, you shouldn't overwork physically on the Sabbath, uh, unless there's an emergency or something, you can try to avoid it. Now, that goes to another subject. And this next one says, thank you for your question concerning a husband and wife having sexual relations on the Sabbath. And so it says, when we consider the very first marriage, we see that Adam was created on the sixth day of the week. So only after he named the animals, found there was no suitable companion for him, that God created a woman to be his wife. No doubt they reunited marriage late on the sixth day. This means the first day of their honeymoon was a weekly Sabbath. God intended them to become one flesh. See Genesis 2.24. The Bible also uh, elsewhere shows being uh, one flesh refers directly to coitus or sexual intercourse. Uh, God's first recorded command to the first couple this is in Genesis 1.28, was be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. It tells it just before, right around the time the Sabbath is starting. And the other thing this article, says, this letter says, in short, except for sickness, menstruation, or special times of fasting and prayer agreed upon by mutual consent, the Bible places no restriction on when sexual intercourse may take place between a husband and a wife. See Leviticus 15, 19, 25, 20, 18, 1 Corinthians 7, 3-5. Now, having said that, we also had that covered in our booklet on the Ten Commandments. Yet we uh, recently lost somebody, somebody who was kind of taking a look at us, who had an Adventist background. Uh, he's vehemently upset that we do not uh, prohibit uh, sexual relations on the Sabbath between married people. Uh, we don't see in the Bible we're supposed to do that. Uh, and the Worldwide Church of God also didn't do it. Uh, we're continuing that uh, practice because we, again, looked at the Bible and did not see the position this uh, semi-Adventist or former Adventist, uh, I should call him, uh, held to. But you'd be surprised why people don't continue to support us. They come up with pet doctrines that they're convinced. They're convinced in their own mind that they are right and this is, the most, this is so important and if you don't agree with them on this or that or the other thing, you just have a list of several things. Uh, we couldn't possibly be the right church. So what do they do? They go out on their own. They don't support the end time work. They overlook the fact that in Revelation chapter 3, I talked about church heroes before, that Jesus commends the work of the Philadelphians, which is to go through the open door, get the gospel out, help fulfill Matthew 24, 14, but condemns the work of the Laodiceans. So that's not so good, not so bad. It's, it's lukewarm. Jesus said you'll spew them out of their mouth. And by the way, and I've said this before, but the word Laodicea means people judge or people decide. So instead of basing it on truly biblical criteria, people think they're using the Bible. They think that they've got biblical justification for a lot of these positions where they go off. I've said this before. If you saw all the odd reasons people said they did not want to support the continuing church of God in terms of odd pet doctrines, you'd be surprise. But uh, at the end time, most Christians are going to be Laodicean. Uh, some will be Laodicean on various pet doctrines and will be independent. Some will be Laodicean on church governance and not accept the type of uh, hierarchical governance that we, the Continuing Church of God, believe 
what we should be practicing based on the scripture and based on the practices of the old worldwide church of God. Uh, and others think that being pirates of Laodicean organizations with Laodicean work is sufficient. Okay. Now, next subject. Someone want to know about a holy kiss? Uh, in the days of Paul, it was common in some areas for people to greet one another with a kiss. It was not a, not a law or command with, of God. Uh, in, uh, society, instead, in, let's say, you know, we have society, it's a bit more, uh, been, been more appropriate to actually shake hands as opposed to give a kiss. But with the whole COVID thing, that's even coming less of an issue. Uh, in various European countries and Latin American countries, uh, they still do this. Uh, so it is part of their custom. Uh, interestingly, uh, talking about people who have their own positions, apparently, well, not apparently, I received an email uh, a summer or two ago from this group who was upset that their minister didn't, wouldn't allow them to give holy kisses to each other because apparently when somebody did this, they were a man did this, he was overly uh, physical with a woman and the pastor decided the way to avoid, avoid this was not to have this. And these people thought the minister did not have such authority. And By the way, they were not in the continuing Church of God. Um, I know what Church of God group it was. It's not my former Church of God association, by the way. And I told them that I do think that the minister had discretion there and that perhaps they should work this out with that minister. All right. The next question has to do with uh, uh, teaching children at home. In the United States, we tend to call this homeschooling. The uh, Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, uh, that uh, you're supposed to teach God's commandments, statutes to your children when they get up, when they go down, all the time. And in Proverbs 22, 6, you're familiar with that. Train up a child the way he goes when he's old, should not depart from it. It's the parent's responsibility to choose the method of educating their children, although in some countries you don't have much of a choice. Um, let me read the following from this letter. Teaching children at home is not the panacea many believe it to be. It requires skills many don't have. And sometimes people don't have the time or perseverance to do it properly. And sometimes if you do it, uh, being part of a homeschool association where they have uh, curricula and stuff could be helpful. Uh, one of the problems that I've seen with some kids who are homeschooled is that they have trouble getting along with others and social interaction. And also sometimes the, the schooling is not rigorous enough and they think they're doing well but when they're not. On the other hand, some homeschool kids do, do better than children going to uh, state schools. And I understand why you, people would not want their children to go to state schools. Now in California and a lot of other parts of the, the world, uh, they've got a pressuring toward anti-biblical sexual morality uh, and LGBTQ matters and a bunch of other stuff that they mandate be taught in schools. They always push evolution, etc. Et so I understand why parents may not want their children to, to do that. So our position is if you believe you can handle it correctly, and you're not going to go to be jailed for doing it. If you're going to be jailed, you're not going to help you doing it. Uh, that's, that it's your call. But I also will make a warning, at least in California, children who are homeschooled are not eligible to go to the state universities in California. Um, what they can do still is go to what are called community colleges or junior colleges, they used to be called. And if they do well there, then maybe that they can transfer. Uh, so again, wherever you're at, you might uh, take a look at that, what, what the rules may be. Okay, the next one is a question about proof Jesus was born in autumn and not December 25th. Uh, there's much evidence available on this. Basically, let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 2, because this should give some information here. And that should be helpful. Luke, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So they all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up to Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, 
which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was when they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and, glory, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy to be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be assigned to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was, and the angels had gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. It's kind of interesting, by the way. See, God didn't decide to do this as much as the existing religious leaders. They didn't have a go to the, to the Pharisees, the high priest. And they came in haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and babe lying in the manger. Now notice this is at the time of the census. And I want to read from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Now you realize, Roman Catholic, as grown-up Roman Catholics, I knew that they kept December 25th for Christmas. So I think most of you realize that. But here's what the Catholic Encyclopedia says about this census. The census would have been impossible in winter. Now what does impossible mean? Impossible means it couldn't have happened. There's no way Jesus was born December 25th because that was in the winter. The census was not in the winter. All right. The other thing is the shepherds were out in the fields all night with their flocks. This was not the practice of shepherds in December. They did not do that. So in Luke chapter 2, it absolutely totally eliminates the idea of December 25th being the date of Jesus' birth. I won't go through all the details on why it would be in autumn, but the biblical holy days, uh, there are some in autumn. Specifically, it's called the month, it's called the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar called Tishri. Now, according to Jewish tradition, which we can't rely on as doctrine, obviously, the world was created in the first of Tishri. Uh, so it's possible that's about the time uh, Jesus uh, was born. If you look at uh, the father of John the Baptist, when he served as a priest, etc. You can put a bunch of things together, and that tends to point to uh, autumn uh, or spring, and autumn being more likely. Now, as far as December 25th itself goes, basically, this was adopted because of Constantine. Now, let me read something else from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Constantine can readily claim the title of great, for he turned the history of the world into a new course. He made his version of Christianity the state religion. It's easy to understand that then the emperors yielded to the delusion they could unite all their subjects in adoration of one sun god who combined himself in the father god of the Christians and the much worse of Mithras. Thus the emperor could be found anew in one unity of one religion. Even Constantine cherished this mistaken belief could not be, this is Latin, sol Deus Invictus, that means the unconquerable son, God, to whom even Constantine dated, dedicated his coins for a long time, including after supposedly uh, he saw Jesus and the uh, cross in the sky, or sol Mithras Deus Invictus, which means sun God, unconquerable Mithras. Constantine may have pondered this, because he didn't, he, he nor did he absolutely reject his thought, even after uh, he, he had his vision. And the Catholic Encyclopedia in an article on Mithraism says, the pagan religion, on December 25th was uh, observed as Mithra's birthday. Okay? It wasn't until uh, 
Sometime in the 4th century that the Church of Rome was keeping uh, December 25th, as Jesus' birthday supposedly, it's Christmas. Uh, this is under Pope Liberius, according to uh, uh, the World Book Encyclopedia. But some think it, it started under Constantine, and most likely it did. And there's some other reasons to go into where it could have been from. But basically, the, even the Eastern Orthodox in Constantinople didn't adopt it until uh, later than that, probably about three, four decades later is when they finally picked it up. So basically, uh, the reason we don't believe Jesus was born on December 25th is, according to the account in Luke chapter 2, this was at the time of the census, and according to Catholic, Catholic Encyclopedia and other sources, it was impossible to have a census that time. So obviously didn't happen then. And also according to uh, Luke chapter 2, the shepherds were out with their field, out in the field with their flocks all night. And if you look at the records of history, you'll find they didn't do that. This is actually one of the reasons why church history is so important. People will sometimes tell me, just show me the Bible, and only the Bible. And that's, that's fine. The problem is a lot of people because of being mistaught about the Bible. Think the Bible says certain things it doesn't say, or if it's mistranslated, they don't understand it as well. That's why looking at church history can be helpful. In this case, we're not looking to church history, we're looking at early Jewish history, and Jewish history for that area says, no, shepherds were not with their flocks outside on December 25th. So that absolutely, positively did not happen. And so that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons to not observed December 25th. There's more, such as the pagan ties. Alright, this next one is a little bit tricky. This has to do with 2 Chronicles 30. I was going to actually read the scripture, but I think instead I'm just going to read uh, mostly the letter. Thanks for your question concerning 2 Chronicles 30. Some have attempted to use this chapter to prove that Ephraim and Manasseh were not taken captive by the Assyrians. The Passover mentioned in this chapter, however, took place before the, the general captivity. And it's only natural that two tribes would be there. Uh, the temple was restored and cleansed in the first month of the first year of Hezekiah's reign, 2 Chronicles 29, 3-36. The Passover was observed the second month of his first year, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 2. Now let's ask, when did the general captivity of Israel take place? Answer, Years later, not until Hezekiah's sixth year, and you can look that up in 2 Kings 18, verse 10. 2 Chronicles 30, 11 might make it appear that the whole tribe of Manasseh humbled itself to God, but this verse doesn't say that. We find only a few hundred, excuse me, only a few humbled themselves. In the King James Version, the word diverse is used. Any good English dictionary shows it means various. So it's not saying the entire tribe of Manasseh came. Similarly, verse 18 does not show that all Israel attended the Passover. It merely refers to those who were there. They did not remain in Judah, but returned to their own homes. Second Chronicles 31. 1. Remember, all this took place before the captivity by the Assyrians. Alright, so... You know, you'll see a lot of arguments against what's called British Israelism, and this is just one of many. I haven't ever dealt with this one before because it hasn't come up, but I've dealt with various other ones that they try to prove uh, something that they can't prove. Because if you believe the Bible, and you believe the Bible is true, you would have to believe that the promises that God made to through Jacob to Ephraim and Manasseh in uh, chapter 48 and 49 in the book of Genesis had to come to pass and they have come to pass under uh, the blessings that happened with the old British Empire, which is the largest land empire the world had ever seen, and under Manasseh, the United States, which is the most powerful single nation uh, the world's ever seen. And so it definitely, definitely fits, even if people stumble on certain points to get there. Now, the next question, people want to know what the word sir means, not S-I-R, C-I-R, period. Uh, it's abbreviation for circa, which means approximately or about. Sometimes it's instead abbreviated C period or C-A period. Okay, and I use that from time to time uh, as well. 
Now, this one I do think I want to get my Bible out for. This is about the Bilderbergs and trilateralists manipulating uh, the world politics to increase their wealth. This article says there's many such conspiracy theories. Some allege that uh, the bankers or the Jews or the Council for Foreign Relationships or the for Foreign Relations, excuse me, or the tri Trilateral Commission or the Illuminati or the Bilderbergs or the Order or etc. are trying to put together some type of a, a one world uh, government. And such power centers actually do exist and the Bilderberg have a meeting once a year and they want uh, some type of worldly cooperation. And they're not the, not the only ones. Uh, the Vatican has been working towards this type of thing for a long time. Uh, the Freemasons uh, want some version of this. Uh, the United Nations wants some version of this as well, at least many associated with it. But let's go to Isaiah 8, verse uh, 12. Isaiah 8, verse 12. I'm going to start in verse 11. For the Lord, the eternal Yahweh, thus said to me with a strong hand, instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord your host, he shall be, you shall hallow. Let him be your fear, let him be your dread. So basically what this passage is telling us is that we should not be worried about these conspiracies. Why? Because we know what's going to happen. We've got the Bible. We're going to go to Revelation chapter uh, 12. And just read verse 9. You don't have to go there. We see that the dragon was cast to the out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He's cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. Now, if you skip over to chapter 13, you see this beast rises up. Beast of the sea, blasphemous, and he works with Satan. And another one, verse 11, rises up. And you'll find in Revelation 16, a uh, spirit of demons comes out of all, the, all three of them. All right? So do I believe that, there are, that Satan has influenced people throughout history to try to come up with a one-world government? Yes. Why would they do this? Because they don't believe in God's ways. They don't believe in the gospel of the kingdom of God. They don't think they should have to keep the Ten Commandments. Even groups that say they should have to keep the Ten, ten Commandments. They're like the Pharisees of old. They have ways of, to work around them. Then you've got Protestant types, some of them, who say you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Early Christians kept the Ten Commandments. One of the reasons I'm mentioning this, I mentioned before about people saying, just show me the Bible. And we'll show you the Bible. That's what the Bible says you're supposed to do. But they allowed people to twist scriptures and not so they don't understand. This booklet helps with that and also shows early Christians did believe they had to keep the Ten Commandments. So if you hear modern arguments, that's simply nonsense. Early Christians understood Koine Greek, the language of the New Testament, better than modern Protestant scholars do, and they did not think that the Ten Commandments were done away. Okay, so that's in this book. In this one, the Gospel of the Kingdom of God, people don't believe that the kingdom of God is the solution. Now, the Vatican, if they they have some version of it, but they think that that's like centuries away. They think instead they should be building up something, uh, basically a one world government type thing now. It's not a conspiracy to say it. The Vatican wants international cooperation. They're pushing an ecumenical interfaith agenda. Uh, it's, it's not a private thing that you don't know about. Now, is it possible that in some of these private groups and secret societies, they say all kinds of stuff we don't know? Yes. Is it possible that they're working behind the scenes and doing all kinds of things to help set the stage for the rise of the beast power? Yes. But we don't need to worry about those. God is our refuge. And I didn't read it, but in Revelation 12, verses 14 through 16, uh, God promises or shows that part of his people will be protected during the time of these things gain full power. And then I also comment with what's been going on with lockdowns and everything else. We're seeing some version of uh, a trial run, if you will, of some of these things happening now. now here's the next one. Let's see, how am I going to handle that? Okay, legal rights. Um, 
Paul rebuked the Corinthians for going to court to settle differences between brethren in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 6. Um, as far as disputes involving people who aren't members of the church, uh, sometimes you have to go to court. Jesus basically said, try to resolve it before you go there, if you can. That's Matthew 5, 25 to 26. And, uh, and use wisdom on this. Now, in the United States, you used to be able to rely more on supposedly your rights. Um, be careful, whether you're in the U.S. or some other country, that you think you have an absolute legal right for something or another. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, but be cautious because more and more courts are ruling that you don't have a legal right. In general, if you're facing certain situations, particularly religious ones, it's better to, uh, to try to talk privately with the administrators or whoever you need to deal with on a particular matter. If it has to do with school issues, hopefully uh, you're a good student, so they'll think it's okay for you to be uh, gone or whatever you might have to do. And if you're an employee, employee, hopefully you're such a good worker that they don't want to get rid of you. Be careful about trusting in people. I'm going to read Psalm uh, 118 verses 8 and 9. Psalm 118 verse 8. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Uh, princes were government officials or semi-officials. You know, government rights can be helpful, but government officials and uh, courts may not rule view things the same way you do. It's interesting how in certain courts of law, particularly in the United States, even if the law says something, if it's been interpreted to be something else, the courts accept the interpretation, and that looks called plain English for those of us who speak English. And in Psalm 146, verse 3, I would like me to read this. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no hope. So again, be careful. Uh, it's not that you don't have any legal rights, and it's not that you should never make a, file a police report or some if somebody hurts you or steals for you or does something. But again, be cautious on the whole legal right thing because... Sometimes governments don't view it the way you think that they should, and sometimes people get vindictive as well. All right, the next one has to do with the hour of Jesus' crucifixion. So this is going to be confusing, basically because the Jews and the Romans used two different times, the ways they counted the hours. And in the Gospel accounts, we see two different kinds being used. Jews began numbering the hours from sunset, so 12 hours for night, and then 12 hours a day were from sunrise. The Romans began theirs from midnight, and again at noon. In modern terms, it says, it says Jesus was crucified about 9 a.m. He wasn't dead then, but they put him there. To the Romans, this was nine hours from midnight. To the Jews, it was three hours from sunset. Hence, it's called the third hour in Mark 15:25. And darkness covered the land at about 12 noon which had been uh, 12 o'clock noon for the Romans and for the Jews it would be 6 hours after sunrise Mark uh, 15, 33 Luke 23, 44 Matthew 27, 45 and the darkness lasted until about 3 in the afternoon so so third hours from noon according to the Roman reckoning but 9 hours from sunrise how the Jews did it John 19, 14 mentions the 6th hour and this was uh, around sunrise, based on the Roman time. And that was about three hours uh, before uh, they were doing, they put Jesus up on the stake. So there's no contradiction on there. Okay, this next one, and I was, this is what I was debating if I was going to try to cover. But yeah, we've got plenty of time, so I'm going to cover this. This has to do with uh, the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It starts off by quoting from Halley's uh, Bible handbook. The captivity, which was then drawing to a close, last, had lasted 70 years. Daniel is here told by the angel it would be, be 70 weeks until the coming of the Messiah. See verse 24. The 70 weeks is generally understood to mean 70 weeks of years. That is 70, 
sevens of years, or seven times seven years, that is 490 years. As if the angel were saying, the captivity has been 70 years, and the period between the captivity and the coming of the Messiah will be seven times that long. Seven in the cycles of seven sometimes have symbolic uh, meanings, yet the actual facts of prophecy are most amazing as follows. The day for which the 70 weeks was to be counted was a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. See verse 25. There were three decrees issued by Persian kings for this purposes. The principal one of these was 457 B.C., given by Artaxerxes. The 70 weeks is subdivided into seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week. See verses 25 and 27. It's difficult to see the application of the seven weeks, but the 69 weeks, including the seven, equals 483 days. And based on the day for a year position of Ezekiel 4.6, uh, which is a commonly accepted interpretation, 483 years. The 483 years is a period from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the coming of the anointed one. Verse 25, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem was 457. If you add 483 years to 457, that brings us to uh, 26 AD. Although that's an error. He missed year zero. That would be 27 AD. Uh, furthermore, uh, uh, let's see, he says we make a slight correction on that, which I just said, which is he had the year off a little bit. Now we have a book called Proof Jesus is the Messiah. And I want to read some, a fair amount from this book because this has been kind of confusing for lots and lots of people. And this is part of the third chapter of this particular book. And I believe uh, if, if God is calling somebody who is of Jewish heritage uh, and they'll read the third chapter of this book, uh, they should clearly realize that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, I think they should read the first two chapters as well. I think everybody should read the first two chapters of this as well. Because I want people to be certain that Jesus is the Messiah. Not, oh, maybe, yeah, I get this good feeling about him. Ah, he was a good teacher. No, I'm not saying he wasn't. But you need to be certain. Well, anyway, the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel has been used uh, by various ones who claim Christianity to disprove Jesus is the Messiah. And uh, that certainly makes sense. Uh, and I alluded to this, but let me go to Daniel 9, 24. And I'm going to read from the Jewish Publication Society. In this particular chapter of this book, I quote from Jewish sources, so Jewish people do not think it's uh, some Christian did something or the Protestant James thing or whatever. So it might be a little different than what you have in your Bible. Daniel 9, starting verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, make an end of sin, and forgive iniquity, and to bring everlasting righteousness, which is what Jesus did, by the way, and to seal and profit to anoint the most holy place. Know, therefore, discern that from the going forth the word to restore, to build Jerusalem, and one to anoint a priest shall be seven weeks, for three score and two weeks it shall be built again with a broad place and moat, but in troublous times. And after the three score and two weeks shall the anointed one be cut off and be no more. And the prince of the peace who shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary, then will be the flood and the end of the war desolations are determined. Now how is that proof of Jesus' Messiahship? Well, first of all, it's supposed to it shows that the Messiah comes before Jesus was born. And I want to read from the complete Jewish Bible, different translation, Daniel 9.26. Then after the 62 weeks, um, Mashiach, that means Messiah, will be cut off and have nothing. The people of the prince yet to come will destroy the city and sanctuary, but Zen will come with a flood. Now the anointed one, is the, that was the term in the Jewish Publication Society, is called Messiah or Messiah in this one. Notice that the Messiah comes before the temple was destroyed. If not, the Bible's not true. The Jews should consider the ramifications of Daniel 9.26. And also, you know, Daniel 9.24 ties the timing to a decree. Now this decree is in Ezra 7, verses 12 to 26. It says, after the cutting off the anointed one in Daniel 9.25, the city's going to be destroyed and the temple's going to be destroyed. And that happened. Jesus was killed in 30 or 31 A.D. 
and Jerusalem was destroyed in the temple. Actually, it was in August of 70 AD. Okay, so that's happened already. Everybody knows that. Uh, that happened. Uh, the old uh, uh, Radio Church of God taught about this too, talked about this decree uh, when it was from Artaxerxes in 457 BC, and that gets us to, to, to now. Now, there's a Jewish argument against this, but this is what's called a, a red herring or false argument. What it is is they, they found some Protestant group that has used a different decree and a different date. Okay? And there says this decree was from, the Protestants say the decree from Artaxerxes was 444 B.C. But we in the Continuing Church of God say, no, it was 457 B.C. And that's also what uh, Halley's Handbook said. That's also what the old Radio Church of God says. So we've been totally consistent about this. And I, in Ezra 7, if you go there, I'm not going to read it all, but we find that uh, Ezra is there in verses 7 and 8. There's a letter from the king Artaxerxes to Ezra the priest in verse 11. And let me read from the Jewish Publication Society, starting in verse 12, what this letter said. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, and so forth. And now I make a decree that all they, the people of Israel, and their priests, the Levites in my realm, are minded of the mind of their free will to go to, to Jerusalem and go. And then they, they did this. In verse 25, this is again from Jewish Publication Society, it says, And you, and this is again from his decree, Ezra, after the wisdom of God is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges that you judge the people by the river, all should know the laws of God. And whatever who won't do the law of God, the judge would be executed upon him. Then we see this part from Ezra, probably. Blessed be the our Lord, God of our fathers, who put this thing in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So Ezra said, no, this decree was given by Artaxerxes to rebuild, to beautify the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. That happened in 457. Now, if one accepts Daniel 9 and one accepts Ezra 7, we know this is referring to as the Messiah, and everybody should accept the fulfillment of that happened in the first century. Now, there's a Jewish writer by the name of Abba Halal Silver. He said that many Jews did expect the Messiah in the first century. He wrote a book called The History of the Messiah, Specul Messianic Speculation in Israel, 1927. The book of Daniel, the one canonized apocalyptic track of the many which were widely uh, circulated and held in regard by, high regard by people, dwelt on the mystery of the end of days. Prior to the first century, Messianic interest was not excessive. The first century witnessed a remarkable outburst of Messianic Emotionalism. This is to be attributed to the prevalent belief induced by the popular chronology of that day. But what does that mean in plain English? It means, according to him, Jews weren't really looking for a Messiah before the first century, but in the first century, because of looking at what popular chronology, that means what did everybody think this all meant? The average Jewish person was under the impression that the Messiah was supposed to come in the first century. Jesus came in the first century. And even though people may doubt that, the reality is the temple was supposed to be destroyed after the Messiah came and the temple was destroyed. I'll also comment that there was a, in the Middle Ages, a Jewish writer by the name of Shlomo uh, Yachaki, and he's known as Rashi which stands for Rabbi Shlomo ben Isaac. In the 11th century, he wrote about Daniel uh, 9, 24 to 26. And he talked about the 70 weeks decreed, uh, talks about from the destruction of the days of Zedekiah, uh, and he talks about the time of the exile and all this kind of stuff. He says, after those weeks, the anointed will be cut off. 
Uh, Agrippa, the king of Judah, was ruling at the time of destruction, will be slain and be no more. This is purely an expression of a prince and a dig dignitary of the city and the sanctuary, literature in the city and holy, and the people of coming monarch will destroy, and the monarch will come upon them. That is, Titus and his armies. Okay, what does this mean? What it means is, he says, look, there's this prophecy, and it happened. Titus destroyed the temple. He did it in 70 AD. And somebody anointed was supposed to happen there. Okay? Now, there was this guy called Herod Marcus Julius Agrippa. And he was king of Ju Judah around 27 AD. Basically the same time Jesus started his ministry. So if the timing of Agrippa is right, like Rashi wrote, then obviously the timing of Jesus was in accordance with Daniel 9, 24-26. Now as far as Agrippa goes, the Jews revolted against him in 66 AD. And later he helped the Romans and their general Titus conquer Jerusalem. He was rewarded for his efforts in uh, helping Rome. And he lived and reigned decades after the fall of Jerusalem. But he was not the anointed king Messiah. Now as far as Rashi goes... Uh, apparently the reason for him having the messiahship go, going uh, to Agrippa because of uh, Israel's sins. Because Rashi wrote, after 2,000 years of Torah, it was God's decree that the messiah would come and the wicked generation would come to an end and the subjugation of, of Israel would be destroyed. But the reality is that Jesus did come at the right time and the temple was destroyed as prophesied in Daniel 9. And there's other, uh, one of the most distinguished Jewish biblical commentators uh, from the 12th century, a guy named Abraham ben Ezra. He taught Daniel 9 leads up to Titus and to destruction. So even Jewish authorities, religious authorities said that's the case. Yeah, here's something that's kind of funny. This was in the Talmud. This, so this was a couple hundred years after Jesus came probably. The Messiah will not come in accordance with the opinion of our rabbis. This is from Sanhedrin uh, 97b. Why did they say that? Because they've got two problems. One, they had the rabbis who said it was supposed to come in the first century, which it did. And Jesus did. And others who picked later times. There was one, who, there was a bunch of them who predicted the second century, and that was wrong. So, as far as uh, Daniel and, and those those weeks go, yes, we believe that, yes, many of them, most of them have been fulfilled. Yes, Jesus came on time. Therefore, that is absolute proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay. Now, it looks like I'm going to actually cover everything I thought I might cover. I wasn't sure, so I was hesitant about giving my list at the beginning. Next one is, what about Deuteronomy 33? Why Moses didn't uh, pronounce a blessing on a tribe of Simeon when he blessed others? And it says a possible reason that Jacob, Israel, excluded was because he had excluded them before. If you look at the blessings that uh, are given, uh, we find out that uh, Jacob was not thrilled with what uh, Levi and Simeon did. This is from Genesis 34, 25. Simeon and Levi are, are brethren, instruments of cruelty, cursed be their anger, etc., I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So that's what we see in Genesis 49 as opposed to the type of blessings many other tribes got. Anyway, this says this was fulfilled the intermingling of the Simonites inheritance to Judah in Josh, Joshua 19.1 and dispersion of the tribe of Levi amongst the tribes, Joshua 14.3-4. All right. So the last one, this one I was debating if I wanted to cover, but this is, I think, is good to cover. Question concerning whether or not a Christian man can wear an earring. Now, the Bible, this says the Bible does not speak directly about the matter of men wearing earrings. I would say that's not really true. But it does say if we find guidelines in God's word on such matters. Really, that the Apostle Paul says even nature or common sense teaches us, quote, this is First Corinthians eleven fourteen, The man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. 
When this is considered in context, it's obvious Paul is saying it's shameful for a man to look like a woman. That and that should be our basic guideline. Men and boys obviously should appear masculine and not uh, easily be mistaken as feminine. And the other way around, uh, men and boys should not look like women and girls. And the other thing to remember is our Christian attitude should be one of modesty, humility, and service to God and our neighbor. To make a male look like a female or vice versa is going to extremes, usually motivated by personal vanity or, and is condemned. It is our character rather than our outward appearance should be our, our outstanding and memorable quality. In the case of men wearing earrings, there are several things to consider. In keeping with the culture and customs of this nation, Western culture in general, men and boys who wear earrings on an everyday basis have been looked upon as unmanly, abnormal, uh, rebellious, or gay. And this, of course, varies on the place. According to the Word of God, a Christian is not to appear strange or outlandish in his actions or attire. The Bible does not encourage us to call undue attention to ourselves, and it certainly speaks against rebellion. Of Romans 1, 28-32, 2 Corinthians 12, 20. And we're supposed to avoid all appearances of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Even the women who normally dress more fashionably than men are admonished to dress modestly. Christians further exhorted to live at peace with his neighbor as much as possible. So I'd like to comment that in uh, Exodus uh, 32, verse 2, it specifically talks about the Israelite uh, males wearing earrings. And in uh, Judges 8, 24 to 25, the Ishmaelites were wearing, men were wearing them too. But I would like to uh, mention Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. A woman should not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garments. For all who do such things are an abomination to the Lord your God. Well, I hope going through some of these questions has helped you. You, you may have wondered about some of these subjects. Uh, in time, I intend to go through everything in this binder to, again, to have a variety of topics being covered. But today we talked about organ donations and chewing tobacco, Joseph the Koch, servile worship, kisses, uh, sex, and homeschooling, uh, December 25th, conspiracy theories, re legal rights, Daniel prophecies, tribes, and uh, uh, many wearing earrings. I hope this helps you because we do base our doctrine upon uh, the Word of God. And knowing some things about early history also helps fill in some gaps to answer questions that many have. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.